you for joining us for week two of Airflow Management Awareness Month. Uh, today we're going to speak about hot and cold aisle containment. How much do you really need and which is best for you? I name, my name is Kennedy Williams. I'm the Senior Marketing Manager here at Upsite Technologies. And without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to Al Zoldos, the President of Upsite Technologies, for a few words. Hey, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining. Welcome to today's, today's webinar. Today we're going to uh, talk about a topic that we get asked about frequently, hot aisle or cold aisle containment. Which one is right for me, and how much containment do I need? So it's a question that we get frequently, and we thought it'd be a great topic for, uh, for, for a webinar. Today is the, is the uh, second in a series of web four webinars we're presenting um, uh, during this year's Airflow Management Awareness Month. Last week we covered uh, Airflow Management 101. Um, th that presentation pres provided uh, the IT facilities professionals with a, a really good understanding of the positive results that are achievable when deploying industry best practices for airflow management. Next week, June 21st, we'll cover um, a state of the data center, preparing airflow for the digital evolution. Uh, that will be hosted by our very own uh, Lars Strong uh, with, a, with a guest speaker, um, Mr. Bill Clayman. Bill is CTO of MTM Technologies. He's a member, a member of our technical advisory board. Uh, Bill is an industry veteran, and he has extensive experience in you know, data center design development, um, uh, deployment, and management. Regarding Upside Technologies, we are known as uh, pioneers of airflow management in the data center. As you may or may not know, our founder, Ken Brill, was a proponent and visionary for creating data center efficiencies. Ken was also the founder of the industry think tank, the Uptime Institute. When Ken founded Uptime Technologies, you know, the mission was singularly focused on helping data centers gain thermal efficiency by improving their airflow. Those thermal efficiency aids, uh, you know, could have significant impact, positive impacts on your data center operator's capital expenses, your operating expenses, and your and your carbon footprint. So it's no wonder that Ken was known as the father of the modern data center. In keeping with uh, Ken's messaging, we we we've uh, uh, launched uh, last year our Flow Management Awareness Month. It'll be an annual event for us. Um, today's topic will be uh, uh, presented by Lars Strong. It's hot aisle, cold aisle containment. How much do you really need, and which is best for you? Lars is our senior engineer and chief and company science officer. He's a thought leader, recognized expert in the data center in the industry for optimization. He's also certified a U.S. Department of Energy data center efficient, uh, energy practitioner and HVAC specialist. So without further ado, I will turn the call over to Lars Strong. All right. Thank you very much, Al. Well, I appreciate everyone being here. I appreciate you taking the time to join us and uh, look forward to making this as valuable as possible for you. There's a lot of subtleties and, and questions uh, that come up around containment, and so I encourage you to, uh, as we go through the presentation, uh, take note of, of questions you have or issues you might have with something I say. I welcome uh, any uh, disagreement. I mean, we all can learn a lot more from uh, digging into something that uh, seems wrong to, to each of us. So appreciate you. Uh, asking questions at the end, and then, of course, I'll be available to follow up after, uh, after the webinar one-on-one -on -one if that's necessary. So let's get started just with the concept of, of why airflow management. And I would like to relate this and show this slide in every presentation that I do. You know, PUE has become the most widely recognized metric in the industry for efficiency. And it provides some really nice insight into how important airflow management is. When we, we take a look at the, the total consumption of the data center uh, for a PUE that ends up at about two, that means about half the load, half of the power is going to IT equipment, and the other half is all the infrastructure that supports it. In a uh, mechanically cooled data center, uh, which the vast majority of them are, we see that 35% of the total load is the mechanical plant and cooling fans, and that ends up being about 73% of the non-IT load. So there is a lot of room for leverage by reducing these, these large loads. Uh, just in comparison to the electrical load, when uh, there may be a very good argument and a very good uh, ROI for improving the efficiency of the electrical equipment, 
but it has a relatively small effect on a relatively small portion of the pie. The, the greatest point of leverage, as I say, is, is in the cooling. And the way to improve cooling is to improve airflow management. So let's look at some prerequisites for, for containment. Uh, we're going to touch on these again towards the end. But really, you know, the price of admission for doing containment is having air, the, the fundamentals, the raised floor open area management done really well, sealing all the cables, perforated tiles in the right place. And then, of course, rack open area management done really well. The basics of blanking panels and rails sealed. Uh, and as we'll touch on, what's really crucial as well is having the IT equipment breathing front to back. Um, if, if that's not happening, then the, uh, the environment's going to be contaminated. And depending on which containment method uh, you are running, uh, that'll have a, a larger or a smaller effect. So uh, these these fundamentals are just kind of the, the prerequisites, the starting point for being able to get more out of containment. I've seen sites where they have not done this and they've gone ahead and spent the money on containment and I'll show you an example of that and it's, it's really just kind of a waste of money it's really better to uh, get these things taken care of first or all at once if the case may be you know get this stuff and containment all taken care of once if you have a big upgrade project is is happening you know so when this these fundamentals are taken care of we often end up with a scenario like this 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 picture shows uh, about as good as it can get without any containment uh, we have cold air delivered to the cold aisle, all the cable openings are sealed, um, hot aisle, cold aisle configuration, and the trick here is balancing the amount of air, re reducing the total supply volume as much as possible to get as close to matching the IT demand volume. We'll talk more about that concept uh, shortly. Um, but still, without containment, without doors, particularly, you see air leaves the cold aisle, comes out of the cold aisle, may wrap around. Air comes out of the cold aisle and returns back to cooling units. So you're going to lose air here. If you have more excess, you might also be seeing some cold air go straight up out of the aisle. Um, that can be happening in a portion of the aisle, even in a portion where uh, even in an aisle where somewhere else in the aisle, hot air is wrapping over a little bit. So it's real common to see warmer temperatures at the top of the aisle because a little bit of mixing is occurring. Um, so there's just the best we can do without any containment. I want to show you a little bit of data, uh, just kind of hopefully to help you get a sense of, of really getting serious about the fundamentals of, of airflow management, the prerequisites, because a lot of sites aren't doing this very well. This is data from 45 sites that I've visited around the world, and we see that it's actually not being done very well. We see that the uh, range of sizes in this data set of 45 sites, again, the average is, a, is about 7,500 square feet. Um, and one of the most important metrics uh, is the raised floor open area. And so if there was a room that had with a 25% open area, so that would be one square foot of good open area in front of IT equipment. So forty eight percent bypass open area. So 
we look also at hotspots. You know, this is this is the most important um, parameter of a data center. The data center exists to provide uh, continuous cooling, continuous power, uh, continuous connectivity. So if we're not providing the right intake temperature, then we're not uh, effectively cooling the IT equipment, obviously. So hotspots, there's still a substantial number of sites with hotspots in some of the cabinets. And what I'm seeing even more of recently is cold spots. I'm seeing locations where intake temperatures are below ASHRAE's recommended minimum. Uh, means very cold air is being used to uh, supply the equipment and that's usually done to overcome poor airflow management conditions and uh, and then we have a very large range in, in intake temperatures. Perforated tile placement is one of the simplest ways to improve airflow management to manage airflow in the computer room and on average of these 45 sites 77 percent of the perforated tiles were properly placed. Only six of these 45 sites had all, uh, all of the tiles in the correct location. Uh, I understand it may be hard for you. So my audio may be jumping in and out. Um, so I uh, apologize for that. i um, not sure what we can do to improve it. Um, let's talk about uh, why there's some of these problems in the data center. Airflow management, airflow is invisible, that is. You know, we don't often get to see air move around. Um, and so it's a little hard to understand, conceptualize what's happening in a computer room. Uh, cooling capacity is difficult to quantify sometimes. Uh, also, in the U.S., we use the unit of tons of cooling. While most everyone knows what a ton of cooling is, very few people know how to define a ton. So my recommendation is always for people to convert everything to kilowatts. All you have to do is multiply tons by 3.512 um, and uh, um, you have kilowatts of cooling capacity. Then there's a lot of vendor influence that's creating mixed messages in the market and there's a lack of education just about the pure science behind best practices. And, and the big picture, understanding the, whole, the room as a whole and not very specific uh, aspects of the room. Uh, it's easy to lose sight of the big picture when we focus on just trying to solve small problems. So one of those areas that I'd really like to uh, bring awareness to is the bypass airflow concept. So there's a lot of misconceptions here around what eliminates bypass airflow and just what it is. Uh, there's bypass airflow at the cabinet level, conditioned air passing over the IT equipment, but bypass airflow is really important to understand at the room level. So in these next few slides I'm going to show you all the cooling units are represented by this one cooling unit and all the IT equipment in the room is represented by these two rows. So there's 10 units of air moving through all the cooling units. And so if we stuff 10 units of air under the raised floor, then we will have a total of 10 units of air coming out of the raised floor. And in this case, we've still got some cable openings under the cabinets. So we have six units of air coming out of the cable openings. And we have four units of air delivered into the cold aisle. We see that the IT equipment requires a total of four units of air, so that's, that's a sufficient supply to meet that demand of IT equipment. But we've got this six units of bypass airflow, so we want to seal those openings, obviously. However, it does not eliminate bypass airflow, because now all ten units of air is put into the cold aisle, and the IT equipment still only needs a total of four units of air. So six units 
is leaving the aisle as bypass airflow. Now how this relates to containment is that a lot of people believe that if we put doors on the ends of this aisle and we put a roof and we button this, this aisle up tight, that we've eliminated bypass airflow. Well, even if this is really well sealed, then we're not letting any air out of the aisle through open spaces. However, we're still delivering more air into the aisle than the IT equipment requires. And so this extra six units of air has to go somewhere. And it gets stuffed through the IT equipment. So we have the IT equipment asking for four units, but each row asking for two units, but an extra three units getting stuffed through. So we still have the six units of bypass airflow. It's just air now that's getting stuffed through the IT equipment. And uh, this doesn't particularly damage the IT equipment, but it's just wasteful. It's extra fan horsepower pushing more air around than is required. So the way to actually eliminate or reduce bypass airflow is to reduce the amount of air moving through the cooling units relative to the amount of air moving through the IT equipment. That's the only way to change the bypass airflow ratio in the room. This infrared image shows just uh, how that can occur. This is showing that some nice hot air that came out of the backs of equipment, out of IT equipment, is returning and flowing into the center of this uh, cooling unit. This is looking down on the filters, the top of a cooling unit. And then all around it is cold air that is air that came out of tiles that didn't pass through IT equipment and just flowed back to the cooling unit. So this is this is pure bypass airflow. And the only way to eliminate it, like I said, is to reduce the amount of air moving through the uh, room. If the cooling units have variable speed fans, then the fan speeds can be reduced. And if they don't, then the only way to control you know, the total flow rate through the room is, of course, by, by turning off cooling units. So what does containment get us? Let's look at some of the, the benefits that occur regardless of the type of containment. Well, it helps keep that separation between the exhaust and the supply, so it protects IT equipment from from high intake temperatures. And it enables energy savings in a number of very important ways. And I've highlighted this enables because containment actually will not, on its own, create savings. Other adjustments need to be made to realize those savings. So putting in containment improves the separation between supply and return, which enables the reduction of fan speeds. Less air is required to keep the IT equipment happy. It enables the ability to reduce chiller operating costs by increasing the supply temperature of conditioned air and increasing the supply, uh, the chilled water supply temperature. But unless it's a very sophisticated system, it's very unlikely that those things are going to happen automatically. They're going to require some intervention, some adjustment of set points. And very substantially, it enables increased access to free cooling hours. And in, in some cases, the absolute elimination of mechanical cooling and 100% free cooling by improving the airflow management in the room that much. So containment is, is a recognized best practice. It's, uh, called out in all the relevant uh, industry standards and design guidelines. And California has even taken it a step, forder, a step farther. And uh, Title 24 of the Building Energy Efficiency Standards requires containment. Now we'll start talking a little bit more about the different aspects of hot versus cold. 
And a, I, one of the most common questions I get is, which is more efficient? They're, if done well, and that's a big caveat that I'll explain, if each is done well, there's no difference in efficiency. Um, Intel, in uh, conjunction um, with T-Systems, did some research back in 2011, and their conclusion was that there is no significant difference in the efficiency improvements possible with hot or cold. So really what we're saying is where are we drawing the line between, the, where are we creating the separation? All we're doing with containment is separa separating supply and return. And we're just putting that separation in a different location. So if it's done well, the same end result is achieved. So obviously, here's a basic schematic of what uh, hot out containment looks like. We've got the cabinets arranged in a hot out cold, cold out configuration. The hot air, exhaust air flows into a common space and it's held with some sort of a barrier in full containment and it is ducted, it is returned all the way to the cooling units. And in this case, we have air coming out of a raised floor supplying the rest of the room, which is the cold aisle. And the rest of the room becomes a flooded cold supply. So here's some more aspects of, of aisle containment, of hot aisle containment, that is. Um, it makes it easier to accommodate fire suppression. NFPA 75 and 76 define the cold contained space as a separate volume. And that creates a lot of uh, challenges, um, construction requirements, uh, or more expensive solutions such that if a, the code requires that if the cold aisle is, is fully contained, then that space either needs a fire suppression system of its own, the sprinkler heads put down inside the contained space, or that the roof gets out of the way um, upon a smoke detection. So this, there are solutions out there for achieving that, uh, but they uh, often add a lot of cost and complexity. Hot out containment really lends itself to non-raised floor environments as well, um, and it simplifies the supply. And I'll show some diagrams of, of how the, that's the case. Hot out containment is more forgiving for equipment with non-compliant airflow directions. Uh, and accommodates, you know, those larger boxes that that stand on their own and don't fit in in a uh, in a common row. You know, it's because when you contain the hot aisle, the rest of the room is the cool space, and so you can put equipment in that space, and uh, it's going to receive um, cooling. The hot aisle containment really works well with free cooling and single sourced flooded supply. A lot of free cooling involves, you know, large fan walls or big heat exchangers, um, heat recovery wheels, and uh, they're not like cooling units that you can spread around the room. All that cooling comes from a single location in, in many cases or a single wall, uh, and so you really, it really lends itself towards flooded supply. It's not required, but it definitely is uh, the preference. So when we do hot aisle containment, the hot aisle space is going to be somewhere between 90 to 130 degrees, you know, approximately, depending on the delta T's and the flow rates, uh, the supply temperatures. Um, that makes the rest of the room, the cold space, and I put cold in, in quotes here because it's really not very cold anymore. If you're doing computer room cooling optimization well, then the coldest place in the room is going to be somewhere between 70 and 85 degrees. Not exactly cold, um, but it, uh, it uh, is still the cooler side of the room. The requirement for hot aisle containment, of course, is, is a plenum, is a drop ceiling, some way to contain that hot air and get it back to the cooling units. So here's an example of a uh, non-raised floor environment where 
there are perimeter cooling units and they're just blasting air out into the room across the floor. This is flooded cold air uh, supply and then ducted hot aisle enclosed return to the cooling units. Here's an example of what I spoke about earlier, earlier about single sourced or, or flooded supply. So when you have a big fan wall, outside air, maybe evaporative cooling or some other form of cooling, uh, it's likely going to be delivered in a, in a single location. And with hot out containment, as long as you get the air into the room, even in a single location, then you can flood the room and uh, the air is going to get where it needs to. Uh, but then you can exhaust the air uh, once you've captured it. But it doesn't have to be fully contained. Uh, so here's an example. A lot of rooms take a iterative step to this. A lot of sites, uh, they get all the equipment in the hot out, cold out configuration. They take care of the prerequisites. And then they switch over and start using the ceiling, the drop ceiling plenum for a return airflow path. They duck the cooling units to the drop ceiling and they put in return grills, uh, registers in the ceiling grid uh, of the hot aisle. And even with no containment, this can get substantial, can create substantial improvements um, because it's very unlikely for this hot air to go over the top of the cabinet, even if there's no containment no barrier because it's going to always flow to the point of lowest pressure. It's going to flow the path of least resistance as they say and, and that's very often going to be uh, up through these returns and back to the cooling unit. So then it's possible to add doors, add baffles and, and take a, a stepped approach to improving the, the uh, airflow management in the room. Let's talk now about some of the ins and outs of cold aisle containment. So obviously we're putting doors and we're containing the cold aisle space to some degree and the rest of the room now is that flooded space. That's where all the hot air now is filling the larger volume. It's really a consideration of which volume is contained. Um, is, the, is the cold volume the smaller volume or is the hot volume the smaller volume uh, in the room? So with cold aisle containment, it's more difficult to accommodate that non-compliant equipment, that standalone equipment backing up here because obviously if it's not able to go in one of these rows and it's sitting out in, in the rest of the room, then it's, if done well, then the rest of the room is, is hot air and it's surrounded by that hot air. Uh, and that relates also to the free cooling and the single source cooling. So if done well, the cold aisle space is going to be 70 to 85 degrees uh, and that's that small space in the cold aisle. The rest of the room is 90 to 130 degrees. And so this is what I spoke about earlier when I said that uh, if done well, they're both as efficient. You know, these numbers are the same as they were for, for hot aisle containment. It's just that the rest of the room is now this very hot space. And very few sites are willing to take their room to this kind of a temperature. They don't want to open the door and, and get hit in the face by 100 degree air. Um, but if it's done right, if it's done well, and I've, I've been in a number of sites where, yeah, you walk into the room and it's 100 plus degrees um, because they're doing cold air, cold air containment well. Um, with cold aisle containment, it's the reciprocal, as I spoke about, need to deal with the fire suppression in the room. And uh, it, it's going to come down to the local authority having jurisdiction as to uh, what's acceptable. And there are a number of uh, partial containment solutions, you know, doors uh, just on the ends of the row. Uh, whether it's hot or cold aisle containment, doors on the ends of the row um, create a lot of benefit and uh, are almost never an objection, uh, objectionable to the uh, local authority. Um, baffles over the cabinets are, uh, may or may not interfere with the sprinkler uh, patterns 
and that's something that needs to be discussed with the local authority. So cold dial containment though is the most popular for raised floor retrofit environments because it's so simple to implement uh, aside from the fire suppression issues. But all you have to do if you've already got the cold air contained and, and supplied to the cold aisle, all you need to do is put doors on and, and or baffles and a roof on top of it to button that cold uh, aisle up and achieve the benefits of containment. Um, so it is the most popular uh, just because of the ease for uh, retrofitting in a raised floor environment. It can be achieved for a slab environment, but that requires ducting that conditioned air uh, all the way to the, the cold aisles. And it does become vulnerable to insufficient supply rates. And as I mentioned in the bypass airflow explanation, oversupply. So some sort of pressure control is, is often very useful with uh, full cold aisle containment. Here's an example of uh, a site where very extreme cooling is being accomplished, 55 kilowatts in a cabinet, and there's no roof over the top of the aisle. Doors on the ends of the aisle uh, and these baffles, these vertical baffles, as long as the, there's sufficient supply into the cold aisle, um, then the, air, um, the balance can be achieved between supply and demand and you don't need the uh, full containment uh, to achieve the, the full efficiency. Here's an example of how containment doesn't solve all your problems. It's not a panacea. It uh, does require some consideration of airflow uh, volumes and balancing flow rates. So this image, it's a little hard to see what's happening here, but you see the handle, this is a, a door, this is a fully contained cold aisle, and I opened the door and then took this picture uh, to get the results because you can't see through a door with infrared imaging. And the bottom of the cabinets are still very cold, the tops of the cabinets are, are too hot, there's not enough cold air coming into the aisle uh, to support the demand of the IT equipment, so the IT equipment is pulling hot air through the cabinets. Um, it would pull air through in some way, even if uh, the cabinets were sealed up tight. Uh, it would be causing problems. So this site, what they really needed to do was seal the cable openings so that they had enough air coming into this aisle to meet the demands of all the IT equipment. And then they wouldn't have needed to uh, purchase the full containment. Here's a number of myths. I've, I've done a very popular presentation uh, over the last few years on just the, going into a bunch of the myths and half-truths about containment. Uh, here's a sample of them. We already touched on this, that containment eliminates bypass airflow. And uh, you should know now that that's not the case. You have to balance, you have to adjust the flow rate of conditioned air to demand to achieve uh, the reduction of bypass airflow. Um, Another one is full containment is essential. Uh, partial containment doesn't work. My favorite example of that is I visited a site and they had put in uh, curtains that hung down, no roof. Uh, well, they had a roof and they had uh, curtains. And they said that the curtains didn't work because they blew out sideways. Um, obviously, they were delivering way more conditioned air to the cold aisle than the IT equipment needed, and that excess air had to go somewhere. So with the meat locker curtains, they were just blowing out, flapping in the breeze like Marilyn Monroe's skirt. And uh, I said, well, what'd you do? They said, oh, well, we put in hard, full, full hard containment. And that say, solved the problem. And actually, it had just made uh, the problem uh, invisible. They hadn't changed the flow rates of conditioned air. So now, with the full hard containment, all that extra cold air was getting stuffed through the IT equipment and was still being wasted. Um, a big one, and this is one of the most the hardest ones to explain, is that containment increases the return air temperature to the cooling units. It enables the ability to increase the return air temperature, but the cooling units have a have the thermostat control, and they're going to do their best to maintain that temperature, um, regardless of what's happening. 
uh, there's still the same amount of air moving through the room and there's the same amount of heat being added to that air so there's the same increase in temperature and the same overall return air temperature. There can be isolated pockets of change uh, but uh, the average won't change. And then related to all this is containment improves efficiency and you know, reduces costs. Uh, it enables that to happen, but it doesn't do it on its own. Here's some more uh, pictures to show just what's happening with the air in the room. So you know, here's some aisles. Here's a cold side. Here's a hot aisle. Here's a cold aisle and another hot aisle. And there's no containment in this scenario. We see hot air, this cross section, right at the ends of the row show that you know, some hot air is wrapping around these cabinets and, and filling this end of the row here with some hotter air. That's really common. Um, the middle of the aisle has quite a bit of good cold air, but the excess is getting blown away and, and very often some hot air can wrap in the top edges here. And the same thing happening on the other end of the row where hot air is coming in the ends of the row. So when we put doors and, and partial baffles on this aisle, even though we haven't completely capped the aisle, uh, fully contained it, we've done the most important thing, which is preventing air from wrapping around the ends of the cabinets and also preventing that cold air from escaping out of the aisle. And the only open area is where the small excess conditioned air now escapes and if cold air is leaving the space then it's impossible for for hot air to get in. One of the things I see most often overlooked in computer rooms is the gap underneath the cabinets. Here's some CFD modeling uh, representing uh, how important that is. Even though everything else has been done right in this aisle uh, there's a one and a half inch gap underneath the cabinets and that allows hot air from the hot aisle to flow under the cabinets, come into the cold aisle, and even there, there's sufficient cold air here, this hot air coming under fills the space and prevents the cold air from going into the intakes here. So when you seal that, obviously it's gone and now the cold air can, can fill that space. So another real important place to, uh, to fill to achieve uh, the benefits of containment. So to, to help you with this whole process, we've developed the concept of the four R's of airflow management. We look at the rack, uh, the row, and the raised floor, and the room. And so when making airflow management improvements at the rack level, uh, you can you can take this as a bucket as a as a a task. You know, airflow management is is not a one time event. It's an ongoing process of continuous improvement, and so you can make an effort to say let let's just really focus on improving the rack airflow management at this point. And once those improvements are made, it's important to check in at the room level to go look at what adjustments can be made to the controls to the set points to realize the benefits. How much can fan speeds be turned down? How much can supply temperatures be increased now that we've made these improvements? And the, the same goes for improving airflow management at these other levels. We've got a short, it's about a four minute video on this and uh, it might be a useful tool to you even if you ex understand all these concepts to share with others and uh, be able to explain to, uh, to management, senior people, just what's the concept of airflow management. It, it, it walks through these different places, aspects of airflow management and the process of, of improving, of optimizing the cooling in a, in a computer room. I want to show you the families of solutions that we've developed. Just uh, highlight a couple of these. Uh, so raised floor grommets, obviously really important to seal those cable openings. So the cold lock family addresses sealing of the raised floor. Our hot lock family addresses sealing all the openings in the rack. Uh, I want to highlight a, our latest product uh, addition to this family is the switch fix. 
a lot of uh, rack mounted switches at the tops of cabinets are mounted on the back rails and even if they breathe front to back the intakes are so far back in the cabinet that they're ingesting very hot air so this creates a duct from the face of the IT cabinets back to those switches and there's also variations for side breathing switches uh, that can really help improve things in the room. The uh, room level uh, monitoring uh, we have both wired and wireless solutions, uh, up to uh, 300 sensors and industry uh, best uh, leak detection uh, rope, sensing rope. What's most appropriate you know, for this topic of containment is our aisle lock line of products and uh, our, one of our newest members to that is the magnetic under rack panel and this is a panel that uh, attaches magnetically to the base of the cabinets and uh, toollessly you can attach it, you can adjust the size of it to seal that, that gap under cabinets. And of course here's, here's some better pictures for the aisle lock modular containment bidirectional doors and the baffles that, that go over either a cold aisle, angled baffles to uh, partially contain the, and hold the conditioned air in the aisle and in a hot aisle, you don't want to restrict that open area. You just want to uh, direct that air up and out of the aisle as uh, much as possible, get it where it needs to go. We also have the adjustable rack gap panel that fills spaces between cabinets. And that pretty much wraps it up. I want to let you know about uh, the next two presentations as Al mentioned in the beginning here's the information on those and, and we'll be sending out emails of course about those and let you know that you can watch all of these uh, webinars you can watch the recordings of them uh, from our website so if you have any questions um, I'll put up my contact information here and we can discuss any questions you have now uh, or you can reach out to me at another time. So thank you very much. All right, awesome. Thank you, Lars. So we've got a, we've got a few questions in here um, for you. The first one is that for a colo data center, which aisle containment is best? As we can't control what type of equipment the client is going to bring, like some equipment taking fresh air from both sides, Sun 10K, for example. Uh, yeah, absolutely. There's a number of very um, difficult pieces of equipment, Suns and Cisco's that don't play well in the sandbox with others, obviously. Um, so for a colo, uh, probably most on the perception it's that uh, hot out containment is going to be the best solution because you really are going to have a hard time selling space in a colo when the rest of the room is the hot space when you walk in the door and, and the room is, is really hot. Um, and of course, unless you're doing entire customers for an entire room, um, multi-tenants, spaces filled with multi-tenants are going to be a lot more challenging than obviously, a, you know, one customer taking an entire room. Um, so, you know, full containment, getting everything perfect is going to be unlikely it's going to be a lot easier to uh, to keep moving people in the direction of uh, continuous improvement and doing as much cold aisle containment as possible. Um, and in and in colo spaces, the it's really important to address the fundamentals, the the rack airflow management. Um, I know a number of sites that provide blanking panels for their customers, and uh, and they have an agreement that if their customers don't install the blanking panels, then they'll go into their cages and install the blanking panels for them. Uh, we, we've done a number of things on this topic. Uh, we've written a blog on uh, airflow management in colos, whose responsibility is it, who benefits, who should pay. Uh, that's available. So I encourage you to uh, take a look at that if I haven't answered all your questions here. and uh, happy to discuss it more with you. Okay, great. Uh, there's a there's one related kind of related I guess uh, based on your answer uh, is there one place that's better to start a containment uh, system hot or cold aisle so I guess basically is hot or cold aisle better yeah um, well is it you know it, it comes down to what you have like 
I tend to uh, steer people towards hot owl containment. It, it has a number of advantages over cold owl containment. However, it can be harder to implement. It, it requires a plenum return. And so if you don't have a plenum return, then it's just simply not an option for you. And um, you're going to have to uh, move towards cold owl containment. So that, that gives a little more information, but I'm not sure if I've answered the question. Happy to discuss it more. What is a uh, conservative percentage of savings that we can present to management in order to present a containment project? Uh, um, this, so what's the ROI going to be is a, is a great question. And, and there's no way to give you an answer of what it will be, of course. But I can give you some guidance on, on how to calculate it. Uh, and one of the most important aspects of identifying how much potential there is for return is looking at how over deployed the cooling is in the room. So we developed a metric called the cooling capacity factor. And it works best when the fans are running at, at full speed. If they have variable speed uh, drives and they are uh, you know, turned way down below 70%, then, then the numbers uh, get a little wonky, but when at a high flow rate, uh, you know, full fan speeds, it's it's a really effective metric, and it's it's pretty simple. It's a way to estimate the utilization of the cooling infrastructure in the room. So if there's say 10 cooling units, and they're each a 30 ton unit or 100 kilowatts of cooling capacity, then there's one megawatt of cooling capacity installed in the room. And you just divide that by the IT heat load, the UPS output, plus 10%. So if uh, the UPS output is 500 kilowatts, so add 10%, add another 50 kilowatts, you got 1,000 divided by 500, you got a CCF, a cooling capacity factor of about 2. There's about two times more cooling capacity running in the room than IT load. And that number should be about 1.2, 20% extra cooling capacity. So that number very quickly identifies um, the potential for savings. And then there's some calculations that can be run on what the return will be from fan speed reductions. Uh, requires knowing the uh, horsepower rating of the fan motors and the number of, of fans and 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 estimating how much airflow, uh, how much fan speed can be reduced. So it starts to get pretty, uh, there, there needs to be some calculations done to put an actual number on it, but identifying the potential is, is pretty easy to do. Okay, and I, I think this one's kind of on the tail of that one. Uh, what is the value or parameter maximum for installing a containment in a, I believe this is watts per square foot. Um, there's really no, um, if I understand the question, there's really no point at which containment is a good idea. Um, you know, containment's a good idea at any density. Um, it becomes more and more necessary at the higher densities when there's a lot of hot air blowing at high velocities out of, of big high power consuming equipment. Um, but it's a it's a good idea. It will improve the efficiency regardless of the uh, the average density in, in the cabinets or of the room. All right. It looks like uh, that's all we've got for today. I want to thank everyone again for joining us for Airflow Management Awareness Month, week two. I uh, hope to see you all back again next week, and uh, you have a great day and the rest of your week. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much. Goodbye.